welcome to a new Paradigm of Education podcast. I'm your host, Monique Sayers. Today, we have a very special guest with us. Her name is Shan Goodspeed. Before I introduce Shan, I'd just like to introduce the podcast. A new Paradigm of Education is an awakening in education. It's something that's been coming for many, many years, but suddenly the world is prepared. We've seen more and more schools being, um, being built and more and more schools being decreated. We've seen all different change makers coming together and holding hands, whether that's parents, mentors, teachers. The old idea of the teacher sitting out the front of the classroom is the old paradigm. The old, uh, old idea of the teacher being the leader is the old paradigm. In a new paradigm of education, it's a circular movement where everybody's there holding hands together, creating leadership as one whole piece. So who I've invited today is uh, Shan, as I've mentioned, and she's one piece of this beautiful movement of a new paradigm of education, which is here to help change evolution of education. And it's really done just through all of you. It's got nothing to do with me or even the name of new paradigm. It's just really a space for us to all come together with our thoughts, our ideas, our creative ability and take steps, whatever those steps are. So I will just introduce Shan. She's got an amazing background. <laughs> so first of all, she's a home, a home educating mother of two girls. She's also an experienced primary school teacher. She's also the founder and owner of an education business, which is called Flying Start Tuition. She's also founder of Be More Giraffe, Compassionate Connection Workshops for Parents and Children, also with NLP practi um, Practitioner and Empowering Learning Practitioner leader of a home education group on a farm, which I can't wait to hear about. And she's also an education visionary. So I'll leave it at that for this moment and just allow you to introduce yourself to everybody. Shan, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Monique. And um, thank you very much for asking me. I'm, I'm delighted to be joining you in this space. Beautiful. So did you want to just share a little bit more about yourself as a lead in um, so people can get a feeling of your story or who you are? Yeah, sure. So, um, as you said in the introduction, I, um, I've seen the education system from a number of different viewpoints. Um, firstly, I obviously went to school myself. Well, not obviously, but I did. <laughs> um, I have two children who we've home educated pretty much from the start. Um, my eldest, Charlotte, did go to school for a couple of years. Um, she's now 14. And my youngest daughter, Ava, is 10. She uh, didn't go to school from the outset, but about a year ago, she decided she'd like to give it a go. So she went in um, to our local village school. Unfortunately, it was during the one of the pandemic years. And so she didn't get to experience school quite how it normally would have been. And um, due to various lockdowns, she didn't attend that many days in the end. Um, but she was she was able to attend part time. And we found that that balance worked really nicely for us as a family. Um, I was a teacher for uh, about 12 years um, in uh, various private and state schools in, in England. And then after my first daughter was born, I decided to leave the school system to set up my own education business, uh, Flying Start Tuition. And the reason for that was because I absolutely love teaching. I'm passionate about teaching. However, I was really struggling with the work-life balance, juggling being a new mom. And so I figured that um, setting up my own business would give me more flexibility. Well, little did I know <laughs> that running a business is not quite as, um, as simple as it maybe seems before you've, you've started it. Um, but that business is still going. And um, Flying Start, the aim of Flying Start really is to have an integrated approach to learning. So we do support children with academic subjects, but we also integrate um, strategies to help them learn how to learn and mm. also how to deal with, um, how to cope emotionally um, as well as academically. And as you mentioned, I'm also a practitioner of NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming. And so we've embedded quite a few techniques from NLP into the courses we run at Flying Start. Oh, that's amazing. And have you noticed the children having different, um, like differences within the children, like emotionally and academically through the NLP, like from when they come to you and when they're leaving you or when they're still with you? Like what, is, what have you Absolutely. noticed? 
Yeah, absolutely. So some of the techniques we use, I don't know if you're familiar with NLP, Monique. But, I've, I've um, had it practice, yeah. uh, practiced on myself before, yeah, by other people. I am aware of what it is, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So um, one of the techniques we teach the students, for example, is a technique called anchoring, which helps them to change their emotional state. And um, quite often children have uh, exams and tests and they can feel quite stressed. Um, and anxious about those. And so they can use the technique anchoring to change from feeling anxious into feeling calm and confident. Um, and what we found when we've taught children these techniques is that they seem to um, take to them pretty easily. Uh, they, they just kind of accept them and do them. <laughs> um, I think as adults, sometimes something that's new like that, perhaps if we're not familiar with it, it might seem a little bit odd or strange, and, you know, whereas children do just kind of take things on board. That's that's been my experience. And a lot of children have used the techniques we've taught them in the uh, sessions with us in other areas of their life as well. So not just academically. So, for example, going back to anchoring again, um, I do one of my hobbies is singing and I get quite nervous when I'm on stage. So I use anchoring for that. And some of the children have said they've also used it for performing um, or for when they're playing sport uh, and that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, the, the, the great thing about the techniques is they're pretty simple, easy to teach and the children take them on board and then they can apply them in all areas of their lives. Yeah, I really feel like this is the pathway of the new paradigm and us as educators and parents just need to step out of the way and get rid of all of our old paradigm habits and just throw them out the window and just be mm -hmm. in that place of curiosity and openness like the child. And it's from that place where all the learning is actually going to be happening. And like you're saying, being open to learning these techniques, it's amazing because it's a lifelong skill that they'll be able to use and manage in all situations. You know, it's not like, yeah. I, know, I know, for example, maths can be useful when you need to go to a supermarket and you want to add things up or something. It's a skill. But I think more importantly is having a skill that's going to teach you happiness and to feel regulated inside and having a place to go if you don't know where to go like how can it support me oh I can use this technique so that's really really powerful mm. that you are offering that in um in your school I've, I had been wondering because I've been following you and I'm like what does she do so thank you for <laughs> sharing all of that have you used it with younger children or is that just with teens I'm just curious um, most of the children who come to us are around the eight, nine, ten mark. So, yeah. so that kind of age predominantly, yes. And um, both my daughters use the techniques as well, and they're ten and fourteen. So wow. they can be applied to all. And actually, um, we've now started teaching them to parents as well because the parents can then obviously support their children with these techniques at home. But some of the parents have been coming back and saying how useful they found them. So, so that's a bonus, you know, that uh, the whole family is, is being supported in this way. Yeah. And anchoring is just one, one of many um, techniques that we teach them. Amazing. Yeah, it mm. sounds really powerful. Is that also what you're doing with the Be More Giraffe? Because it says here, what is compassion and connection? So is that Be More Giraffe or is that is that part of your company or is that another kind of project that's added? That's, that, that's another another venture. Yeah. Wow. So I set Be More Giraffe up last year um, and it was response really to a lot of uh, the division that I was seeing, particularly on social media, and I was, um, I'm quite a sensitive person, I'm officially a highly sensitive person, <laughs> and um, I, I was getting quite distraught by it all, and I wanted to, um, to do something really, to try and help and to have a voice and express how I was feeling, but in a way that would hopefully inspire people to think a little bit differently. Um, and the Be More Giraffe is basically inspired by my training in nonviolent communication, which I've been doing um, probably for about eight years now, um, on and off, which I initially went into actually to help myself communicate more compassionately with my children. Um, and <laughs> the, the name is, is based on um, the animal metaphors of the giraffe, which uh, Marshall Rosenberg, who's the founder of the Center for Nonviolent Communication, he used the metaphor of the giraffe to represent the inner compassionate being inside of, of all of us. And the, the other metaphor is the jackal, who represents um, how we are when we're not connected within our inner compassionate selves. So be more giraffe, the, the phrase came from, um, but basically, when I was training with MVC, I came home when sort of the initial years and I would start talking to the children about it. And I got myself two puppets. I think you can see one of them, uh, one of them just behind me. And um, I 
explained the concepts and then one day I kind of was being a bit jackally to be honest and one of the girls said I'll just be more giraffe mommy <laughs> and uh, this the saying kind wow. of stuck so I now use the saying be more giraffe to myself to remind myself to be you know more connected to be calm it's all about being calm being present being connected with life force and not letting all the jackally talking um you know that, that we tend to have in our heads all of the time take over so being present being connected with life being um compassionate to ourselves and then to those around us because i think when we when we get disconnected with ourselves um and we start to allow the inner critic which is the jackal come in then it's much harder to be compassionate to those around us and I felt that was such an important message that um, I set the site up and it's a, basically it's a blog site. And I also run workshops to help parents connect with their children, to help children understand the concepts of nonviolent communication um, through the giraffe and the jackal metaphors. Yes, well, I have heard of this work of Rosenberg, and I think it's amazing that you've been able to connect that again with children and with families and to really support everybody and even just support yourself from what you're, you're sharing, because I know myself, I would totally fluctuate between both of those identities um, constantly <laughs> and always the way to bring myself back into that place of connection is through meditation, which is um, yeah. has always been my place of uh, regulation. And from that place, then I'm able to give everything I can out to students and and children and, and things like that as well so I'm really mm, in awe of that I, so and I love important. your puppets yeah. <laughs> so do you, thank you the jackal is home. which way do I need to move to show oh, you oh I can't see the jackal uh, I'll show you the see. jackals there look you oh, see on the there it is. Yeah. so the people who are on the podcast you won't see them but the people who want to tune into YouTube you can take a look at her puppets they're really amazing <laughs> I bet the children really respond to those too because it's it's playing out role plays and it's yeah it's taking Absolutely. their identity away yeah. and yeah and for me the jackal and the giraffe having those images actually really helped me to connect with and embody those those two sort of sides to us and to understand the concepts um and because of that they've just kind of stuck so now whenever I teach the the um, nonviolent communication skills I do it through the metaphors of the giraffe and jackal and of course it appeals to children but it also appeals to a lot of adults as well amazing <laughs> could you go through a little bit about what you'd share in the course like if somebody wanted to come and take a course with you around that like just a quick little overview to get people interested because I know I'm, I'm now interested <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sure. So, well, if anyone's interested in finding out more, I'm actually doing um, a talk and running some workshops coming up in, I'm not sure when this is going to go out, actually, but sort of March and April time. Um, but fundamentally, what we what I'm teaching um, children and parents, but in a slightly different way, is to understand that there's a jackal and a giraffe inside us all. And that when we're connected with our inner giraffes, um, we learn how to be present we learn how to give ourselves self-empathy I think empathy is probably the key word actually that people would understand here because um, I think it's so important to um, to love ourselves and to feel empathy towards ourselves and the language that we use quite often when we talk or in a talk or in a jackal can be so harsh um, and the messages that we're sending ourselves and what we're doing emotionally when we, you know, are critical of ourselves um, can actually have a, a really big impact on just how we feel and how we go about our everyday lives. And a lot, you know, children have these voices too. You know, they talk to themselves in their in in that way also. So it, it's teaching them that um, we do have this inner jackal, but learning how to listen to that from the connection with your inner giraffe and to be kind to yourself and thinking about the language we use so there's a it's basically helping children to understand that there is a connection between our thoughts and our feelings and our actions and the fundamental principle of nonviolent communication is that we are all compassionate beings at heart um, and when we become disconnected with that um, we can you know we flip into our our jackal mode, so to speak. Um, and then there's nothing wrong with that. It's just um, learning that or understanding that um, when we're connecting 
from our giraffe point of view, that we're doing that with compassion and we're not judging ourselves. So um, if you want to know kind of the details of the giraffe and the jackal and what they represent, um, have a little look on my website. There's some kind of easy to follow um, explanations of what each one represents. Um, and then we look at how to communicate rather than using the language of judging and blaming through the language of acceptance and um, how we communicate uh, what we, well, at, at the root of all our actions, our needs. And so we all have different strategies for meeting the different needs that we have and how we go about meeting those needs may be different, um, but fundamentally at heart, we all have the same needs and we all have shared values and helping people to understand that I think helps them to view other people's actions rather than judging them and thinking, you know, there's something wrong with them. They can connect with the human that's inside them, the, the compassionate being inside. Um, and I think that's so important at the moment when there's so much violence around, so much division and conflict. That actually, if we can pause for a minute and stop thinking, you know, that person's wrong because they're behaving like that and, and that I'm better than that person or, and all of this, all this judging and comparing and realise that at heart, we do all want the same things. Um, I just think that's a, a really important message to learn. It's a, it's a hundred percent needed, especially at this moment. Uh, the the world the world is moving into a place of what I call oneness, where yeah. division is going to be ending. That is my well, not my goal, but I'm sure many people's goal of the world is that this division is ended and there's this place of oneness. I don't mean we all become the same. I just mean there's this place of compassion of understanding people for who they mm -hmm. are and not for the choices they make or don't make and. I want to link that into education because actually in our book, um, when I was feeling into a new paradigm, it was really hard for me to define exactly what a new paradigm was because I would feel this place of wholeness within me. And I knew that that was also the wholeness of, um, of the world because it's a mirror, whatever's going in is yeah. also going out. And so what I'd seen in the past in education was division, you know, like for example, yep. Um, she goes to a mainstream school, she homeschools, she unschools, she does this, mm -hmm. he does that. He's this type of learner. He's labeled this, he's labeled that, you know, all yeah. of these kind of judgments um, that or labels or kind of sectors of things that I guess maybe were created to, in a way, maybe to help learning, you know, like defining a child as ADHD. Mm -hmm was never the case you know if you look back to the 30s that you know somebody would just be jumping around and they'd just be like okay that child is that way but then all of a sudden yeah. all these kind of labels were coming in and I guess it was done you know in a process of wanting to understand and to help but I also feel like it has caused a major division and as I said even in the world of schooling where there's all these different styles of schooling um yeah I think if you can just look all past all of that and just share your message around compassion and just have compassion for each human being, each child, mm. each student for where they're at in the world, then that's all that's needed and to show up for the highest good of the student. So our book was also all around what is what is going to serve the highest good of the student. Yeah. And that looks different for every single person, right? Yeah. But it, it always does, comes exactly. back to what you're saying, being able to find that giraffe within yourself to then be mm. able to guide yourself to, I like the idea of the neck to heights, you know, to heights, yes. to more heights yeah. and looking yeah. over the situation rather than looking up at the situation like the Jekyll, you know, you'd be yeah. looking down on a bird's eye view at the situation. So mm -hmm. I think that's really, really beautiful. And um, what an, an amazing message to share. So keep on showing up that way. I've been following you, showing up in media with all <laughs> your different you. blog posts and happiness. And I was like, what is this BJ all about? <laughs> it's really amazing. Thank you for sharing with that. <laughs> Um, thank, no, thank you for, for following as well. I think that that's um, so true what you say really as well about um, labelling and that that's one of the things um, in compassionate communication or nonviolent communication um, that it's highlighted as being divisive because it does, it, it, it separates people. And what we really want to be doing now is bringing people together and finding a different way to communicate, a different way to live together. I don't think it's just about a new educational paradigm. I think it's about a new life paradigm. Agreed. And I think education will follow 
Um, you know, my feeling is that education shouldn't be something we do to children. It, it's not, you know, the adults educating the children. I think we're all learning together all the time. And my experience with learning, seeing my children and my, my students and myself is that when we are learning, when we want to learn, we learn. If there's something we're interested in, we go find out, we study and we learn it. If we have a purpose for learning, then, of course, we're far more able to, to learn whatever that thing is. Um, in the home ed community, I've seen many children learn to read without formal instruction. You know, it, kids can learn to read. Um, they don't need to be taught. I'm not saying that means that we shouldn't taught, teach them or help them in some way. Mm. I'm just making the point that it, it's not actually as essential as perhaps a lot of us, myself included, when I used to be a primary school teacher, I used to think, you know, that kids needed to be taught in order to read. Um, and in fact, when I went into the home ed world, I was just astounded <laughs> that there were kids who hadn't had any reading lessons and who could read. <laughs> like, wow, that's amazing. Um, and it just goes to show, though, doesn't it, that that we can um, when we have a reason to do so. A lot of them were inspired to start reading through gaming oh, or wow. through, you know, yeah, real, <laughs> real life experiences. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, my own daughter, Ava, she did have a little bit of formal instruction, but not not a lot. And her reading just took off when when she was ready. And, um, you know, now she's reading um, all sorts of books and and loves it. But she was a little bit later than my first daughter, who was reading probably a good few years, actually, before Ava started. Mm. And, and that's fine. And the thing is, because they weren't in the school system, it, it wasn't a problem that one read later um, and this is one of the things I've, I've come to realize over the years is that where you have a system that has very much age-related goals um, I mean you know this <laughs> but the, the problem with that is we're measuring children against these fairly arbitrary in my opinion benchmarks um, which means that we're setting so many children up to fail Mm. You know, there's and and the problem with that, of course, is when when children are kind of told they're behind and that they have to catch up. This causes all sorts of self esteem issues. Um, it can set them into a, a stress anxiety state, and we all know we can't learn when we're feeling anxious or stressed. Um, and so, it, it, the, the the problem kind of becomes more and more of a problem. But it's not the child who's the problem; it's the system. If they if they weren't these if they weren't these goals that they had to meet in the first place, there wouldn't be a problem. And that's what you see in the home ed community, where children have much more freedom generally to learn at a pace that's appropriate for them. Um, we're fairly we're sort of semi-autonomous in that we have a little bit of structure in our week in terms of what the children learn, but generally it's fairly free flowing. I mean, that has its advantages and disadvantages, you know, but, but they learn and I've noticed that they tend to kind of learn, it, it, it kind of goes up and then they plateau and then up and then they plateau and, and sometimes they drop back down and they come to something again, need to refresh and then they, they go up again. And I think that's just a natural way that we learn. Whereas in school, they obviously, um, a majority of schools, they have to cover certain topics at certain times and they do revisit them. But if they haven't got to a certain level the first time around, they tend to struggle when they're, you know, when they revisit it later. So, yes, what do we do, Monique? <laughs> Yeah, I hear you 100%. I, I, I mean, our whole book is written around this concept, right? Yeah. All educators, like it doesn't matter which educator or even which parent or business owner or human in the world has all been saying the mm. same thing. So I am just mm. curious as to when the system will be catching up with the people because there are people <laughs> behind the system, you know, like I hate to blame things because I always like to come back to me. Well, what can I do? What can I yeah. do? And how can this change, you know? And um, I, I see that you've mentioned here something about um, flexi schooling. So did you want to share a little bit about that? So maybe people would like to know yeah. about that. Yeah, sure. So I, I don't know if this is an option in every country, but um, in England, there is the option to do flexi schooling, which is basically part-time schooling. 
Um, I think it's only accessible to primary school children, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and unfortunately, it's not consistent across the country, and it's down to the individual school and the governing body to decide whether or not they're going to allow it. There's a local school not far from us that has quite a few um, flexi school children. Our village school did allow my, my daughter to do it for um, a a, ter a year sorry but um it was as I said it was during the pandemic so it didn't work out being a full year um and I I think it could be a really good sort of partway solution if if flexi schooling was something that was more readily um allowed by schools then it would give because a lot of parents say they would like to home educate but understandably with their work commitments they can't do it full time and then there are a lot of children who are in school, parents with kids in school, who feel that five days a week is just too much. Um, I like the idea of flexi schooling being more readily acceptable way of schooling. I'm not saying it would be compulsory, <laughs> but that if parents felt they were able to, um, you know, support their child one or two days a week, and then they go to school for three four days a week I think it provides a really lovely balance because what we found with Ava in the the year she was doing it was she was getting a nice mix of academic in a classroom environment which she did quite enjoy you know <laughs> um and then she was able to do things like go to the farm school um that she was going to and we could go on outings and take her to places um various trips and things that come up in the home ed world that we could be involved with um, and then other things that when she was uh, that, that when children are at school full-time they don't necessarily have so much time to do such as pursuing their own hobbies or you know doing some gardening or whatever it might be and it was it's just a lovely balance and the, the other thing that I thought with flexi schooling it actually could be a real benefit to the schools because it means if they could organize it um, well, and I, I, you know, I agree, it would take a little bit of logistical <laughs> organizing and rejigging, but that could enable them to have smaller class sizes. And you could develop a curriculum whereby children could be split into smaller groups for some of the, for example, maths lessons and that kind of thing, and then could come into bigger groups for things like creative um, subjects and PE and, and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, so I do think it, it's something that could work really well and could perhaps provide an intermediate step in between where we are now with um, pretty full on, you know, academic um, five days a week type curriculum to something completely different that perhaps we're stepping into in the next who knows 10 years or so if I'm being optimistic <laughs> yeah I really feel that's really powerful as another another option to add and it's also um, aligning with a new paradigm in the fact that well you know since the, the pandemic how many uh, families parents and, and things like that either chose to leave jobs or had jobs sort of pulled away from them yeah. where they were just at home like okay well what do I want to do now what do I want to create now and we've seen a lot of people kind yeah. of stepping into their own personal power setting up businesses becoming entrepreneurs or just you know just enjoying life more and I feel like um, this gives more space for our parents to be able to do that and if children as, as is, it, and it becomes normalized that schooling is less um, less hours and more flex flexible yeah. hours when they grow up then that's mm. going to be normalized what the work the workforce is yeah. you know and so then it's a shift in a yeah, paradigm absolutely. and then their, their generations are continuing and I feel that's also happening with what you're already doing in the home schooling world because what I've gathered is there's a lot of um, flexibility with what you're doing but there's also those chances yeah. that you can connect with others and you can share perhaps um, if you're not if you're wanting yeah. to work one day you could share with another family and um, you could you know hire an educator if you're not feeling comfortable to educate your child yourself or if you could just yeah. go completely the opposite go unschooling and just let the child learn freely <laughs> like there's just so exactly. many options for people yeah. out there and I love that this is another there are another yeah. one um, yeah, and I, I think also schools could work closely with um, other providers such as forest mm. school leaders. So they could, although the children might not be in um, formal school full time, uh, they could be still supported uh, in other group settings and doing other activities. So if the parents 
were not able to facilitate, you know, supporting their child at home, they could still benefit from a more balanced, um, mixed kind of approach to education. Um, yeah, that so, was something so else yeah, I saw I think as it could well. work. <laughs> yeah, and that was one of the other downloads I had. It was around collaboration. It's like there's all these yeah. people that really want to connect with children, really feel drawn to it being their purpose. And so many people have different skills that aren't taught in schools that children might want to learn. And they may have an exactly. interest in that. So either bringing children out to those areas or bringing them in, in a place yeah. of choice, not like, okay, children, you must suddenly become, you know, a surf instructor. Like maybe the child doesn't like water, right? <laughs> but giving them options, yeah. you know, not just a, a weekly thing, but like, okay, well, what is what is your gift? What is your goal? Let's go with that. And I also see yeah. this place of um, goal setting as, uh, as part of like the curriculum as opposed to outcomes so it's a little bit like the coaching world where you sort of work with a child around what they are seeing as their goal and or maybe they don't yeah. even have a goal maybe they, they just want to play and that's okay as well but it's kind of just allowing them to then explore that and then not necessarily creating milestones or having to create checkpoints but just kind of that just becomes a curriculum in its own way and then they can kind of move over to another way and then there'll be groups of children that all naturally want to do one thing and groups that want to do another mm. another thing and I guess that really just comes down to us as you know how flexible are we how open are we how much are we willing to really step into change because um yeah that's a big question just to ask yourselves like how much how much control do you currently have over your children and how much <laughs> flexibility do you want to allow? And are you able to mm. do that or are you wanting to just stay yeah. who you are? So that's not for us to decide. That's that's a question I'm just asking the world at this moment. You know, it's a big mm. one. <laughs> but I think, you know, the control was, it taken, is. was taken over from us. Um you know, with natural disasters, with the pandemic, with so many things. And we've we've all adapted beautifully. And I think um there's just so much. Uh, I'm in the awe of, of meeting people like yourself and so many other people that have just kind of gone, okay, wow, well, this is it. I'm going to do this instead. And just, and my child will also be following <laughs> this and that it doesn't have to be this kind of fixed and rigid way that we kind of produced, you know, from the industrial era where it's like, okay, it just has to be like this and that's it. <laughs> Please follow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, to put it simply. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I love the idea of, um, moving towards education being more kind of community based and you touched on that a moment ago when you said about you know people with different skills but rather than school being a place children are sent off to and then that's separate from the community still having education centers but they could be hubs of education where adults and children can learn alongside each other you know um people from the community come in and children go out into the community and learn and um, i think um in that way, we can facilitate people really following their passions. And I think that's the key to life, isn't it? You know, I think um, we're all here. A lot of us perhaps have lost our passions and not quite sure what they are as, as adults as we've kind of gone through life. I've certainly met, met a lot of people around my sort of age that feel that they, they've suddenly rediscovered them. Um, but this idea of having uh, education as a, a lifelong journey and it being encouraging people to follow what really lights them up, what sets their souls on fire. And then we would have a much happier population anyway. And I think when we're, we're living from that space, we're far more likely to be able to collaborate, to work together, to come up with creative solutions to the many, many problems we see around us in the world at the moment. Um, and there's a lot of people coming up with creative solutions. Um, it can't happen fast enough as far as I'm concerned. I think, you know, the more of us who can come, the be come together, the better. Um, but yeah, I, I do love the idea of, of it being a sort of seamless, really, between education and life. It's, it's all one part of the whole thing. We are all whole and all connected. Um, and this is something, have we got time for me just to mention the Harmony Project? Oh, yes, that was going to be my next question. I <laughs> was going to topic. ask all about that. Yes, <laughs> we can't, please share, yes. Yes, so um, in kind of searching, as I have been for a while, for, for some kind of answer to the, the feeling that I had about um, there being too much separation in education, um, through a series of synchronicities, as, as is often the way, I met um, somebody called Richard Dunn, um, last year and Richard Dunn is the founder of the Harmony Project and the Harmony Project was inspired by 
um, the book which I've got over here actually, if I can show you, by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, Harmony, A New Way of Looking at Our World. Wow. I don't know if you can see that. Yes. And um, it's a, I recommend reading it. It's a very inspirational book. And Richard um, basically has set up this char charitable organisation called the Harmony Project, which provides school and educators with a framework that aims to put nature's principles of harmony at the heart of teaching and learning. Um, and it's currently being implemented in, in a number of different schools. And then last year, I ran a pilot project uh, for the home educated world based on a care farm, which is um, in, in Lower Stoff, which is not, uh, Suffolk, actually, not far from where I live. And the idea of the care farm project was to bring the harmony principles to life within a farm setting, because, you know, where better to learn about nature <laughs> than on a farm when you're a kid and when you're an adult. Um, and we now so we ran the project the project went really well and we're now rolling it out again a sort of extended version which we're going to do um over the summer term so that's coming up starting next month and the the aim of the the project really is to look at the three key areas of harmony with self harmony with others and harmony with nature and understanding and helping children to understand how we are all connected and how we're connected with nature um and how when everything is in balance and in harmony, we have health, we have abundance, et cetera, et cetera. And alongside that, the children are learning really important and valuable skills such as growing, animal care, um, all sorts of things. And the farm is such a wonderful place to be. We just literally, every time I walk into the, through the gates of the farm, I just feel this amazing energy. I just feel so calm and, and peaceful. And um, my dream really for this project is to be able to roll it out and to um, provide it to, or, or give other um, people who want to work with children in this way, give them a framework that they can use in their settings as well. That's really, really amazing. Um, it just sounds so delicious to, to be learning in this way and just so natural. And I wonder why it couldn't just be there for every day rather than just a holiday program. Yeah. Like, could they set it up as a community based project where families could be living or kind of coming and going from there? Or is it just going to be set up for more like kind of this feel of coming in and going out? Or, and is there like caretakers of the project like that are there constantly with the, the land and caring for all of the so, environment yeah, and everything the, as well? The care farm, it's yeah, the care farm itself is an ongoing um, project and um, that's been there for quite a few years now. Um, also uh, led by a fabulous person called Jeff Stevens. He um, runs the care farm and our home education project on there is just one day a week over 10 weeks being repeated. Um, but it is a project that could be picked up and run anywhere in any setting um, because it it taught what the children do is they learn about the principles of harmony and they learn about connecting with self and others. So I bring in the be more giraffe nonviolent communication skills through that as well. Um, we do meditations and we look at how the chakras are connected and all that sort of stuff too. So it's a very much a wholeness approach to education. I mean, I would love it if um, we had the capacity really to make it more than just one day a week definitely and so ultimately it, it, I guess I'm seeing this as a pilot again it's, it's sort of testing out well how can we learn in a different way what could we do with these principles and that how could we bring these to life for children in a way that's meaningful and that um, potentially could be expanded upon and not just a kind of one day a week thing. So we'll see where we go. We do it one step at a time at the moment, but um, I'm very excited to be starting it back up again. That's amazing. And what I love about what you've shared today are very practical and um, real steps that are happening in the new paradigm and that you're able to bring it to life at this moment rather than it being a vision for the future that we know is going to be changing and, and it is coming because the moment you have a vision, it's already planted and it will eventually yeah. turn into fruition. But what I love is that these small little steps, like it's one day a week, but it's going to grow or it's, it's you know, your other projects are like they're small little courses, but then they could also be growing and expanding. And I love that you've been yeah. trying different kind of, kind of of avenues and applying your own life and your own 
um, knowledge and experience to be able to help so many people. So that's so beautiful. <laughs> really, really, I'm really in awe of everything you. that you've created. Um, the, Thank final, you. the final question, um, which we have covered a lot of, but I just always ask it uh, for the podcast guests is what is your vision for a new paradigm of education? I think really, yeah, we, we have covered a lot of it, but it really is about community and bringing education, um, be, be, education not being about knowledge in and being prescribed, but education being learning through life and just letting it, it flow through you. Um, I think that there are many different ways it could look and that's the beauty of, of the project and, and what you're doing and the, all these conversations you're having. I don't think there is one specific new paradigm. I think it the vision would be for there to be all these different things going on and for people to be able to access whatever resonates with them. Um, so yeah, my vision is freedom for the children and, <laughs> and all of us to choose freedom to learn through joy and through what lights us up so that we can um live together in harmony sounds a bit cliched but you know it's that's what i think really the goal is just to set people free from um the restrictions that we have at the moment in every aspects of our life really so mm. that we can show up with joy every day and, and really make the most of the time that we have on this planet <laughs> oh that's so beautiful thank you Shan and you are a walking role model of this from what I've been seeing with everything oh, that you've been you. creating even with your Jekyll days at least you're owning them right it's like I just <laughs> you know I just love your um, humility and I love that you've got the big kind heart to be sharing this with the world so if anybody's wanting to reach out to Shan, we'll put all of the links to all of her amazing projects and websites um, in our show notes and please reach thank out you. And if anybody's wanting to connect with other educators or parents, you're welcome to join our group, A New Paradigm of Education, and come and join the global change with us, have conversations with us around um, what we can all do together to create change in this world. Yeah. So I'll just close with the line that I always do, which is uh, be the change that you wish to be in this world. Namaste. <laughs>